It's Let's now ride. Time for the words that are recited before each and every game here at Dodger Stadium. Take it away, Finn. It's time for Dodger Baseball. <laughs> How are you all doing out there, Dodger fans? Hope you're uh, having a good week so far. But if you're like myself, recording with these two guys on a Tuesday evening, June 6, I'm pretty pissed. The Dodgers have fallen to 35 and 26. I believe since the last time we recorded, ironically enough, the Dodgers have lost four of their last five, mainly due in large fact that this bullpen is utter garbage. We're recording with the Dodgers just fell to the Cincinnati Reds, 9-8 on the road in Cincinnati. And boy, do we have something to digest and get into. We are brought to you by Fansided, by the way. So go ahead and check out Dodgers Way for Dodgers content. Wow. 35-26. and We're one game behind the Arizona Diamondbacks right now for first place in the NL West. If you could believe that, the Arizona Diamondbacks are in first place. But here we are. It's still early June. But the Dodgers bullpen, man. Where do I start? I mean, Caleb Ferguson, main culprit tonight in the ninth inning, had an opportunity to close it out against the Reds. The Dodgers were up two runs. It was an eight to six game. And Ferguson, who had been pretty solid the first two months of the season, has not been very good in May. I'll let Jake go into that in a second. But wow, allowing three runners to reach via walks. He hit a guy with the bases loaded. That allowed the game to be tied up when he hit Jake Fraley. I don't know what the hell happened to Ferguson. We'll get into why you couldn't take him out as early as you wanted to in that game. But Almonte was bad. Gratterall has been really bad. Dodgers had an eight to four lead when Tony Gonsolin exited the ball game. And this bullpen was atrocious. They went three and a third innings, gave up nine hits, five run runs, four walks, only one strikeout. F man, this freaking bullpen has been just a shit show. Let me cool off for a second and pass it over to Jake Reiner. And Jake, how you doing? What are your thoughts? Man, what a mess this bullpen is. It's been a mess. It's also been good at times, but it's been kind of a roller coaster with this bullpen. But the one barometer that I look to when thinking about how bad it is at the current moment is manager Dave Roberts. If you listen to his post-game comments... I've never seen Dave like this. I mean, or I shouldn't say never, but it's very seldom do you see Dave Roberts actually call out players. He never does it. But tonight, he called out Ferguson. He called out Gratterall. Just the entire, you know, Almonte. He called out all those guys. The one guy he didn't call out, or he basically said, except for, is Evan Phillips. Because Evan Phillips is great. He always is. Always has been. He also called out Tony Gonsolin. Because the Dodgers jumped out to a 3 nothing lead. And this is, this is a point I've been making all season long where whether it's the starting pitching or the bullpen, it just feels like a lot of the, there's a lot of times where the Dodgers will get a lead and then the pitching will just give it right back. And it was like the Dodgers couldn't even enjoy that 3 nothing lead they jumped out to. Immediately, Gonsolin gives it right back to them. And Dave Roberts' point was about Gonsolin is that he had to throw so many pitches in that first inning that he wasn't able to go deep in games, deep in that game. And then by product of that, they kind of had to go into the bullpen and then the bullpen was kind of thrown off. But you expect with an eight to three lead after that Freddie Freeman grand slam, you're thinking, I mean, let's just coast here. Let's just coast to the end. I mean, how many times last season did that happen? where the Dodgers would score eight, 10 runs, and then you can just put up your feet and just relax and watch the rest of the game. This year, the Dodgers offense has been incredible. That's the one thing that has been consistent, constant, and just a powerhouse. You look at some of these games that they've lost recently. I'll just go through a few of them where the offense will put up at least five runs and lose. I mean, they lost to the Rays uh 11 to 10 as we remember in that Sunday day game that was the Gavin Stone catastrophe but they scored 10 runs and lost they lost to the Nationals 10 to 6 i mean they lost to the Reds tonight 9 to 8 they're in every ball game if the 
if the bullpen could just be a little bit better, not even not even like 2022 status, but just a smidge better than they have been, they're winning these games easily. Yeah, all right. Let me uh, get our third co-host for tonight live from Dodger Talk earlier this evening and a friend of the show. He's back on the Incline Dodgers to spill his thoughts. It's Chris Camello, fresh off the Lakers season. What is up, Chris? What up, what up, guys? What's up, Kev? What's up, Jake? And by the way, like I told you guys, that wasn't me. No, I'm just kidding. It was me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it felt good talking to Vasse after the game. I, I was pretty frustrated with this game, but you know what's funny? You could feel something was going on. Once they started chipping away, 8-4 to four with the Muncie error, and then all of a sudden, 8-5 to five as Almonte gives up a run, and, and you still got nine outs to get, and that lead starts to get a little bit smaller. And when you are a bullpen that is struggling collectively, it's not just one or two guys. You can't pin this on Alex Vestia. You can't pin this on Phil Bickford. You can't fit, uh, pin this on any of these guys. It's a collective effort right now. Everybody is struggling. You're coming off of a series where they gave up eight runs to the Yankees in three games. Not to mention what they gave up in the final game against the Nationals, which I believe was another four or five runs. So this team, this bullpen, I should say, has not been throwing the ball well in the later innings. So when you have that and you've got four innings to get, even against a team like Cincinnati, young team, up and coming, there was there was some mismanagement by Dave Roberts, no question about that. I don't I didn't like Caleb Ferguson in the ninth inning, but this also falls on the bullpen themselves. They have got to be better. They were not very good in April. They were flat out terrible in April. If it was a close game, they let they let the lead balloon. Or, or if, it, if the Dodgers were up one or two runs, they gave it away. May, they were great. June, they have not been very good so far. That's just what it is. So the problem right now is just flat out consistency. No defined role, uh, no, no defined closer role right now. And guys are just fighting it. But Dave, I'm glad he spoke up because some of this is on the starting staff as well, not going deeper into ball games. But then again, Dave, you're also culpable. Bobby Miller was cruising on Sunday afternoon. You pulled him after 86. Oh, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. So I'm just saying it's the bullpen themselves. It's mismanagement. It's not putting the guys in the right roles. And I think the biggest thing for Dave, and this is nothing new, lack of feel when it comes to who's got it and who does it well right now nobody has it except for evan phillips chris i wanted i wanted to ask you because you made a good point uh, on dodger talk about how collectively they're good together and they're also bad together and i i kind of want you to expand on that and also maybe try and figure out maybe why that is the outlier here is evan phillips because he's been good the whole time Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, in April, like I said, they were all struggling. Remember how Monte was terrible. Vestia was terrible. A lot of guys that they've leaned on the last couple of years were just not pitching well. And, you know, like I said, if it was a, they were, they were losing a lot of close games in April and they were losing them mainly in the later innings. So, you know, just like, you know how we say kidding is contagious, right? If one, one or two guys is struggling, it kind of feels like they're all struggling. We saw that Sunday afternoon. The top four of the Dodgers lineup, Betts, Freeman, uh, Smith, and Muncie, no hits. They went, what, 0 for 16 combined? So hitting is contagious. I think the same thing could be said about a relief pitching. When guys are rolling, it kind of feels like three or four of them are all kind of rolling at the same time. For whatever reason, this past week, they are struggling. And I think some of that has to do with being overworked this early in the season. They, they had to do a lot of mop-up duty because Kershaw didn't go deep. Urias goes down. May goes down. Um, you know, a lot of their regular guard's been terrible. The ball games, and now you're being overworked. So I think that's a side effect of these struggles right now. So they need to find a way to get themselves back on track because if one or two of them start having success, with the exception of Phillips, like you said, Jake, they'll all start having success again, I hope. Well, and also, and also just, just one more quick point, Kev, before we move on. Um, Caleb Ferguson has been great pretty much the whole season. And these last two outings have kind of inflated his numbers a lot, but yeah. in April, 
he only allowed two earned runs. In May, only one earned run. And and he's pitching a lot during during these months. And then the last two outings, he's been terrible. Um yeah. gave up a combined five earned runs. So I I don't expect that to continue for him because he's been good. He just didn't have it tonight. Agreed. Yeah. I agree, Jake. But I also agree with the point Chris was just getting into about this Dodgers bullpen looks taxed. They probably are overworked, but I don't want to hear it that that was not the right spot for Caleb Ferguson. This was the bottom of the Reds batting order. Five through eight, and then he just didn't have control. Like Jake just said, Caleb Ferguson had only given up three earned runs in all of April and May combined. He is arguably one of their top three high leverage relievers. You had already burned Gratterall, who's been a mess. I'll get into him in a second. Almonte hasn't been the same guy. You're not going to throw him out there in the ninth. Some people are trying to make the case that Shelby Miller should have gone out there and close, but they haven't been using Miller as a high leverage guy all season. And there's a different animal and only certain guys have that capacity and mental ability to pitch in the ninth. It's not like Miller did any great anyways. He gave up a double to lose the game right off the bat. So also, the problem, I don't want to, the- I don't want to hear that. Roberts left in Ferguson too long and let him die because you, it doesn't work like that where you can just plug in the next reliever right away. They didn't have Miller warming up instantly when Ferguson was out there. It's going to take three or four batters to get Miller ready right off the bat. And at that point in the game, Fraley, a lefty was up. So they just rolled the dice. Didn't work. Ferguson just didn't have it the entire night. That's the way it goes. Here's the problem though, with not having a guy like Phillips in the ninth inning exclusively. I get that they want to mix and match with him. And I get that they want him to face the heart of whatever order they're facing that day. I I, I get that. But the problem is, is that if he's coming in in the seventh or in the eighth, that means that the ninth inning, as we all know, there's no margin for error in the ninth inning. You can get away with uh, Ferguson coming in in the eighth inning and then maybe tying the game or even taking the lead. You still have another shot to come back. Whereas in the ninth inning for an away game, you know, you give up the lead. That's it, pal. You're done. You're going home. That's what happened tonight. Spot on. I, everyone argued against me. I said it before the season began. I didn't buy into this closer by committee nonsense. They needed to give Evan Phillips the freaking closer role because it's going on longer than I expected, but Daniel Hudson's still not ready. Never trusted Gratterall to be their closer. He just doesn't strike out guys. You cannot have a closer who doesn't strike anyone out. Ferguson's a lefty. I don't want him to be the closer. Who else do you have? Almonte was due for regression. That's happened. It's time to define a closer. It's Evan Phillips. Most nights he's going to bring it. No more of this heart of the order in the eighth inning. The other alternative, which we can get into right now, is trade deadline. The Dodgers got a trade for maybe a closer and another high leverage arm. Liam Hendricks of the White Sox, my eyes are on you. Ready to overpay. This is probably the year where we have enough prospects and we have to overpay for relievers because, God damn it, we are in 2014 Dodgers bullpen status right now. This bullpen collectively has a 477 ERA on the season. That is the second worst in the entire National League. Fifth worst fifth worst in all of major league baseball let me read you off which teams follow the dodgers the nationals the white Sox, the royals and the athletics what do those four teams have in common they're bad to say they have a hard time selling out ball games at home more of what jake was saying which leads to your point chris they're all bottom dwellers these are all bad teams and then you have the dodgers who are supposed to be the cream of the crop cream of the crop year in, year out, have one of the best bullpens in baseball, and that's just not the case this season. Yeah, and the thing is, is that, you know, you look back at, like, 2020, for example, and you have Blake Trident, who was that fireman out of the bullpen. You could bring him in to face any heart of any order, and that was kind of his role. The reason you were able to do that is because you had Kenley Jansen at the back end. And last season, even though Craig Kimbrell was a gas can, (laughs) everyone else was better. I mean, Vessia, Almonte, I mean, all of these guys were just better and collectively great the entire season. So that's kind of the anomaly or the outlier, I guess, of this collective. The point is, is that if you want to have Phillips be the fireman, you got to have someone else that is just as good, if not better, behind him. And they don't have that. 
Yeah. And as far as Gratterall goes, you know, there's an old saying, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. I have not seen this guy evolve at all. No. Uh, he, pitches, he pitches to contact. It's great that if he can get three outs on eight pitches some days, but you're playing with fire. And for this bullpen, you know what, you know what I, you know what they all actually have in common in addition to them struggling they pitch so much to contact. My goodness, is there a lot of co- whether you're whether it's soft or hard, you gotta have swing and miss stuff if you're gonna be in there for one inning, guys. We all know that you need to have some power arms in there that could get it up to 98 or 99 and miss bats consistently, and they are just not able to do that. You know what I'm saying? And for Gratterall, for a guy that can throw 102 with movement, he has not taken that next step forward. Because he's got the mentality of a closer, but like, where's the stuff where he can strike out two of the three batters that he faces? He has not gotten better since 2020. In fact, I think he's gotten a little bit worse. And this is who he is at this point. I don't think he's going to get better. And okay. that's a major problem. So, yeah, you got to look into interior options. I don't know what this kid Robertson can do. You mentioned Liam Hendricks, Kevin. Um, another guy to keep an eye on, uh, speaking of bottom feeders uh, with the Washington Nationals, Kyle Finnegan. That would be a solid option as well. I'm getting so mad just thinking about Bruce Star Gratterall. Gratterall. Man, Bruce Star Gratterall, are you freaking kidding me? Do you think you're a rhythm, rhythmic gymnast with these aerial moves you're trying to do to throw to first base? Oh, Not my God. Overthrow one against the Yankees, which I think resulted in a run. He did the same shit like a few games earlier against the Nationals. It's this fucking Jeter thing that he's doing. Yeah. I don't understand. He's not aerodynamic. He's Is he trying to win a gold glove? <laughs> well, it's not working. Give him a brown glove because he's been got the poopiest glove of them all. I haven't seen though that much athleticism for a person of that size and stature since Melissa McCarthy and Bridesmaids. Oh my god! I did not know where that was going, but that was excellent. Um, yeah, that was what. What was? I don't understand. Like when you're when you're a pitcher and you have to come off the mound and you're and it's a little dribbler you you, mm-hmm. you don't you don't just chuck it i mean what what is that it's the gold glove thing man he's trying to be a hero god this guy also by the out. way by the way if cody bellinger didn't save his ass in 2020 oh off god. the bat of fernando tatis junior yep is he is gradual even on the team right now like that that moment to me is it always comes back to me, given what you just described, Chris, about him not really improving is like, that's where we started. Yeah, I was and just about to go down that route. <laughs> yeah. This guy gets bailed out by so many defensive plays more than Ford getting bailed out by the U.S. government. I mean, <laughs> James Altman did the same thing earlier this season, robbed yeah. the home run that Gratterall gave up to dead center. He's in the bottom of the league in terms of extension, which I'm still trying to really learn what extension means, but I think it connects to spin rate, which he has no spin on his uh, fastball and he doesn't strike or with anybody at all. Eventually it's going to come back to bite him and someone's going to hit a nuke off him. And we're going to be like, well, who could have seen this coming? So quick shout out on Twitter to say it like the, the uh, say it like they M1. Sorry if I butchered that because we were just covering it. We are just covering uh, everything this guy wanted us to address. Is it time to trade for new bullpen pieces? I think it's time for him to move on from Gradrol. He's not reliable and doesn't strike anybody out. And that was from over two days ago. So that you can see the trends just continue. And I mean, we talked about it earlier in the season with the Dodger signing guys like Alex Reyes and JP Fire Eisen starting to look like these flyers of injured guys aren't exactly working out, especially with Daniel Hudson getting pushed back because God, Phil Bickford, thank God they had to put him on the aisle because he's just given up runs in every outing. That seems more like a phantom IL. If you had to ask me my honest opinion, bullpen man. Yeah. It's fickle. It's a fickle thing guys. And I also mentioned this on Dodger talk. When you look at the giants, for example, they won three world series in five years, right? Did they have the same closer? No, they had three different closers. Now, granted, some of those guys were still there for different positions, but the fact of the matter is it's here today, gone tomorrow. Very rarely are they going to have careers like Frey Kimbrell, you know, even though he struggled the last few years or 
or Aldis Chapman or even Kenley Jansen, where you've got sustained excellence over the span of 10 years. It's really who's hot and who's not and trying to feel that out. It's not just about numbers. And I know Dave and Pryor and all them, they're all about the numbers, but you got to have instincts and you got to have feel. And I just feel right now that's missing from Dave and Pryor and, and, and Bard in, in, as the bullpen coach as well. I think they're all screwing it up. Dave's Dave's always had an issue with feel. Two of those former closers really worked out for the Dodgers. Yeah. Sergio Romo. Yep. Yep. And Ryan Wilson. Ryan Wilson. (laughs) Meanwhile, the Dodgers are trying to patch things up with their bullpen. They signed Ryan Brazier to a minor league contract. I believe he was part of the Red Sox World Series run. He was not very good this season. He's got a 729 ERA. They're trying to fix him. He had a 578 ERA last season, so we'll see if that works out. They also added Mike Montgomery, who was on the Cubs 2016 like World Series team. I don't know. I, haven't, I don't even remember the last time he pitched at the big league level, but he is a lefty who can pitch multiple innings, so maybe there's some value as a multi-inning guy out of the pen if he can turn his career around. Meanwhile, Ken I hear Dial, a lot of what-ifs and maybes. That's what that's, I hear. That is that is exactly what it is right now. And then, that have happened us but because of injuries or inconsistencies let's see what we can do with them and that's why i'm intrigued by some of these guys reyes hudson uh uh ken giles ryan brazier was a big part of that bullpen in 2018 when the red sox made that run so i'm intrigued by it you might be you know uh uh trying to find a a, a needle in a haystack or a, or as tom hanks would say from saving private ryan a needle in a stack of needles but at the same point in time it's worth the look right now because it costs you nothing and you're just searching for answers until you get closer to the trade deadline fellas right now right now all those guys are danny duffy and cole hamels until i see the little <laughs> dodger uniform on the mound being yeah. effective so we i i get your point but it's it's we might i mean we definitely need to make we definitely need to make some moves for some talent that's healthy and good right now like yeah. that's what i want I am excited to see what Nick Robertson can add to this Dodgers bullpen. He's only 24 years old, and he's been pretty damn good in AAA. He's 2-0 with a 213 ERA over 24 games, 25 innings thrown, 37 strikeouts, and holding the opposition to 185. They weren't going to throw him out there in the fire this early on, but maybe he emerges. We haven't really had any rookies called up as relievers that have been really effective out of the pen, I don't think, since what? Caleb Ferguson? Gratterall, if you count him, you have to go, you have to go way back. It's usually just veterans and guys that we're trying to fix. Not too often you have rookies called up coming out of the pen. So maybe this turns the corner and he can be, you know, the next, not obviously not Kenley Jansen, Jansen, but like a rookie that came up in the farm and can be effective out of the bullpen like Kenley Jansen. Yeah, we'll see. Any other thoughts on this Dodgers bullpen? No, I think we, I think we did it. Yeah, that was that There's was long. A, get on track though, but they got to do it incrementally. And I think once they have one good outing collectively, combined with the fact that the starting pitching can go six, maybe seven innings, then the confidence will start to build. They'll tweak some things, and a lot of this, I think, really is confidence. Nobody pitched with any confidence tonight, and I think it's starting to get into their heads collectively. This is five suspect outings in a row collectively. With Noah Syndergaard going for the Dodgers Wednesday against the Reds, after his last disastrous performance against a low-life Nationals team, I think he gave up six runs. Do you think this start against Cincinnati is the last straw? I thought the la- I thought the last time he pitched against the Nationals was the, was the last straw. It's got to be when know. Urias is back, which I believe, based off the reports, Urias will be back in the rotation after a four or five days rest because he just threw this afternoon gave up home runs to the likes of Austin Barnes and a struggling James Altman. But needless to say, Urias will start, I believe, unless he has a setback. So that would leave the Dodgers to have to either demote Michael Grove back to AAA or do something with Syndergaard. I mean, that's the obvious move is to send Grove down. But, and I, I feel I feel bad for Cindergard because after his last start against the Nationals, he just looked lost. He looked dumbfounded as to why he can't get anybody out. He also feels responsible for letting the team down, taking responsibility for that, and he wishes that he could contribute to this team because this team is built to win a championship. And he's just 
not doing anything positive. No, Syndergaard, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Yeah, I I don't. So what? I mean, what do they what What do they do? Cut him? DFA him? I mean, is that? I would move him to the bullpen. Honestly, I would too. I, bullpen. It's as a long man mop yes, up duty. Exactly, mop up duty. So, like, David Price like... role. Let him throw a few back to back outings. You know, go two three innings. See if he can go. You know, one two three scoreless. If he can start to throw those nice outings, you then you can consider adding him back to the rotation. But I think just letting him loose at this point in the season when we need someone to eat innings yeah. could be a mistake unless yeah, he asks for it. Yeah, I see that. I see that. I just, God, I mean, after tonight's loss, it's, 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 it's brutal because you, because you kind of wanted that wiggle room of Wednesday being like, uh, all right, if we, if we lose this game, it's not going to be terrible if we can win the series, but you risk losing the series now now that you've blown game one against the Reds, now you go into game two and you could lose the series easily with Cindergard on the mound. But it's a good point, Jake. I was just thinking about that too. I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess, I mean, he has Phil Bickford's haircut. I mean, maybe he can fulfill that role that Phil Bickford couldn't fulfill except for that one magical outing Phil Bickford had. Um, I, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, he's just so hittable. He's so hittable. Stuff is batting practice up there. It's 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 tough to watch. I hope, I hope that he can that he can pitch well. But again, you know he's on the road, and against a Reds team that's feisty, and they're and they're and they've got a pretty decent offense. And so I I don't know. I I, I don't feel confident at all. Yeah, that Reds team is dangerous because they're hungry. These this isn't like a team trying to tank. These are now the top prospects trying to make a name out there for themselves. And they have a lot to prove. So this isn't like facing a bad uh, Rockies team or a Royals team that has nothing to play for. These actually, these Reds players have a lot to play for, actually. This is a pretty good question. That division is winnable, you know? Yeah, they could very well win the Central with all these guys they're calling up. And if they trend in the right direction, can't count them out yet. Castillo Jason on Twitter. Do we think the Dodgers are overperforming or underperforming? Sometimes I think we are overperforming, but after this series with New York, I think maybe this is as good as it gets. Well, I'll be honest. I thought, and I hate to use this term, even though the series was close, they were outclassed by the Tampa Bay Rays and the New York Yankees this past weekend, these past two weekends, I should say. Um, You know, the Yankees essentially beat them at their own game. You know, they, they they basically said we could outpower you guys and we could out small ball you guys and we could outpitch you guys. And the Rays kind of said the same thing the weekend before. So what it goes to show me is as of right now, there's a lot of baseball left, guys. It's June 6th. And don't forget, last year they went through a bit of a June swoon when, you know, when they got swept by San Francisco up north and Dave kind of called them out and they got themselves back on track. Obviously, it was a different team. No questions there. But at the same point in time, there's too much baseball left to just write off this team. But I, what I will say is, as of right now, to me, they are not a true World Series contender. Too many question marks in the rotation. Whoa. Too many question marks in the bullpen. And I think there are some question marks even in the lineup with the consistency. The offense has been good, but there are still some holes there. I think they're, I think they're a World Series contender. I, 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 I don't. I don't They're know. not at those other teams' level, though, Jake. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to point that but out. In the well, NL? I mean, you could, you could, you could have made that argument last year, and the Dodgers only won one goddamn playoff game. So, I mean, I, I, I think that they'll get to the playoffs, and if you get to the playoffs, you're a World Series contender. So, I think, I think they are a World Series contender. And I, and, and I, you know, if you look at what this team was at the beginning of the season, to the, to the question. I think they're they're neither underperforming nor overperforming. I think they're performing as what we kind of thought they would be, you yeah. know, which is a good baseball team. They are a good baseball team. Um, they're not a yeah. great baseball team, but they're a good baseball team. Yeah, that's actually my answer is I think the Dodgers are performing right where they should be performing with a one exception being the bullpen, which we just spent a half hour talking about. That's the weak link <laughs> on this team. And it's an area they absolutely need to address. And the starting pitching hasn't been as dominant as it has been in years past, but there's also a lot of injuries to their starting pitching right now. I mean, you're missing May and Urias. That's your two and three, arguably, or one and three. So far, it's basically Kershaw and Gonsolin, and then you just hope to get by. Bobby Miller's been awesome, obviously. So 
Hopefully he keeps it up in that dominant fashion, but there's just been a lot of guys who are being mid in the rotation and then the offense. I mean, I honestly, the offense is exceeding my expectations. I mean, God damn JD Martinez, 10 home runs in his last 15 games, man is on fire. Mookie Betts has been playing at a pretty high level, pretty consistently. Freddie and then Freeman. Freddie Freeman, Will Smith, those are all stars. And then even though Max Muncy is a disaster on defense, when he's on with the bat, he is certainly an all-star third baseman right now, whether it's a starter or reserve. So I'm pretty happy with this offense. They could use a bat. I'm excited to see what Johnny DeLuca can add now that Trace Thompson's out a month. Thank God he will be starting against the lefty on Wednesday, actually. So that'll be exciting for DeLuca, but this Dodgers team as a whole, I feel like they are a world series contender. This is, this is a pretty weak NL compared to years past. I mean, you got the Braves up top, obviously. And then the Arizona diamondbacks, if we lose to the Arizona diamondbacks, Freaking fire Dave Roberts because that team is young <laughs> and experienced. That's unacceptable. The Padres are five games below 500. Who knows if they even make the playoffs? The Phillies aren't as dangerous as some people project- projected. The Mets are pretty average. The Marlins, they're somewhat competitive this season. I think they're five games above 500. So the, the West or the National League is wide open. And that's where I leave the pressure and put the ball in Andrew Freeman's court. Because if there's guys on the trade market, there's absolutely no excuse for the Dodgers not to maybe overpay a little because we have way too many prospects at this point. You got to make the moves. Assert yourself at the top. I don't want to hear this. Let's wait for Otani in the offseason for 2024. Freaking win now because Kershaw, Urias are on contract years. And who knows if they're even coming back next season. So get them a second title, goddammit. No more of this. Well, we can maybe do it next year. Win now. I agree. I agree. I mean, this is since Dave Roberts took over this team, this team has been in a very, very good title contention window. And it's amazing that they've been able to sustain it for as long as they've been able to sustain it and be as successful as they've been. And you'd like at least one more title in that, in there, Um, you know, 2017 was 2017, but you'd like at least one more title in addition to the 2020 title. And I, I agree with Kevin. I, 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 I want to go all in. I want to, I want to make sure that this team <clears throat> is ready for the playoffs because with a couple of moves here and there, they're, they're going to be able to compete with anybody. And I, 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 I agree with, with Chris about, you know, early season tests, right. But the Dodgers, destroyed the Padres in the, in the regular season last year, and then got their asses kicked in the playoffs. So I don't know how much stock you want to put into that, even though it is a good eye test to see, okay, how, you know, how do we perform on a big stage so far? Not great. Yeah. Eight runs in three guys against the Yankees. I mean, that was what they, that's what the bullpen gave up. So, I mean, granted you, you weren't playing with the full deck. You, you had two, you very young pitchers going out there. I'm just saying as an early season measuring stick, it wasn't there. It wasn't there against Tampa. It wasn't there against the Yankees. That's all I'm saying. Can things change in a month from now? Shit. Can things change in a week from now? Absolutely. But at the same point in time, you don't want to be coughing up five run leads, even on the road to a team like Cincinnati. And by the way, but uh, Cincinnati scored nine runs without a long ball. So they did it with walks. They did it with singles. They did it with really good situational hitting. So I just wanted to point that out as well. That is a sign of a team that could be on the rise. It's a good point. All right. Here we go. Woo. Man, I got so heated and fired up during all that. I had to take my jacket off because it just got hot in this room. Man, I'm boiling over this. <laughs> but let's do a quick uh, quick shout out to Tick Pick. As it was just previously mentioned, the Dodgers and Yankees faced off last weekend. It was a battle. The Dodgers lost. I was scouting the prices every day, and I did notice you could get the best deals on TickPick. So I highly recommend if you're looking to pay no service fees at checkout and get the best prices to go to Dodger Stadium. You don't even have to live in L.A. You can go to whatever ballpark you want. You'll find the best deals on TickPick. They also do concerts. Other sports, you if you're into this NBA Finals, maybe use TickPick or the NBA Finals. But download the app, TickPick, get the best deals on tickets. Uh, looking, trust me, I'm not lying to you. I use it all the time. Great service. So let's get into this Dodgers-Yankees series. Quick recap. 
The Dodgers won game one. They blew them out, and then they dropped the second and third game of the series. More disappointed in that third game because Michael Grove did his best against Garrett Cole, but the Dodgers absolutely should have won that third and final game. I believe they lost 4-1 final score. Chris brought up a good point. I think the top four hitters went 0 for 16. You're not going to win many games if that happens. So the offense was MMA, but this is a point Chris brought up kind of at the very beginning of the show. And there's also a listener question about it. So let me give a shout out to Dennis B sorry at Dennis Bryan on Twitter. Should Bobby Miller have stayed out for the seventh inning or is Dave Roberts right to take him out? He's been great in his three appearances so far. I hope he keeps it up. I'll let you lead this one off, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, Kevo. Uh, yeah, I, I think here's the thing. They always say when, when a player is hot, they don't get tired. And Bobby Miller was hot that game. Every, all the pitches were working. Yeah. He was at 86. Yes. He's a rookie. Yes. We got to protect these arms. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, use these, use this. Mi corazón es primero. Come on now. <laughs> there we go. I'm just saying, throw him out there for the seventh. You ask him, kid, you good for another inning? Good. You're going back in there. Instead of this, oh, well, especially when you know your bullpen's been struggling, you got to you have that feel thing. That's the thing. And that's what I don't like about Dave Roberts. So 100%, Bobby Miller should have at least started the seventh inning and then have a guy getting warmed up just in case. It's simple, guys. It's not hard. It's simple. Yeah, I guess the, the only counter to that is that the Dodgers only scored one damn run. So it, it you know, it's it's tough. And I I get it. I get it. Should he have gone out there for one more inning? Yeah, but the Dodgers didn't do anything offensively that game, which was kind of funny when we because the way we started the show was talking about how good the offense has been and they overall have been great. Mm -hmm. And in that series, aside from the first game, they didn't they didn't really produce. Um so I, I get it. I, I wish that they would, I wish that, that, that managers today would trust more of what they're seeing in the moment rather than the game plan or the pitch count and all of that. And it's, it's all very, it's all very annoying, um, you know, a, a, as a baseball fan of, of wanting to see uh, guys do well, but also like if, if the Yankees aren't touching them, you know, I mean, let them get a few hits off them. The one point that I did hear during that game, though, that uh, I they said on the broadcast, which I thought was interesting, is that would you rather have him go out there for the seventh? Maybe he gives up a hit. Maybe he walks a guy or whatever. And now you have first and second or, for, you know, maybe one guy on first or a runner on second or whatever the case is. You got traffic on the bases, let's say. Would you rather have your reliever come in at that point or with a clean inning? And I think with this bullpen, the way it's been, I'd rather have a clean inning. I'd rather not risk it and have to pull a guy in the middle of an inning, bring a guy in with traffic on, given how bad this pen has been. Unfortunately, I think they didn't they bring in Gratterall afterwards? They did. And that's when the, they gave up and, the first run. Yeah. He gave, up, he gave up, yeah, he gave up the he gave up the the lead. So mm -hmm. it's well, unfortunate, but I, I, I see all sides to it. Here's why Chris is wrong. What happened to Jacob DeGrom today? Oh, man. That's not a fair comparison. Is that, what happened? Because, they, is that because they overworked what, him? He barely happened? pitches. Okay, I'm good. Just answer the question. What happened to Jacob DeGrom? Kev, I'm about to unload on this, on, on your argument, but I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to answer. I am going to answer your I question am, politely. You. Tommy John surgery, I believe, for the thank second you. time in his career. What happened to Dustin May? Just a month ago. Forearm strain. What has been happening around a lot of Major League Baseball to a lot of pitchers? They're going on the injured list with shoulder and elbow injuries. And you want to know why? Some people want to blame the pitch clock, and I'm sure that's a factor. But the other issue is that most of these starters are going, they're throwing at ridiculously high velocities, including Bobby Miller, who's throwing and pumping out 100. And there's an argument that the arm in this motion is not meant to do that. And that's why a lot of these guys are landing on the injured list. Bobby Miller is just, that was his third start into his major league career. I believe he was also at a season high in pitches already at that point with 83, he had reached a career high in strikeouts with seven. 
the Dodgers offense only put put out one run anyway. So what difference was it going to make if you threw him out there for a seventh? I mean, the bullpen was going to blow it regardless. So what are you what are people trying to say? Oh, it would have made a difference. Dodgers only posted one run that day. So cool. Bob Mueller maybe throws a scoreless seven. It's not going to matter. The Dodgers would have lost. So why are we trying to overwork a kid in the month of June, early June, nonetheless, only three starts into his career where we still got three plus months of the season to go. And he's already going five to six innings to start. At some point, the Dodgers are probably going to have to put Bobby Miller either back down in the minors or on a phantom IL so that this guy isn't gassed out by the time we roll into late September and October. So I think what the Dodgers are doing with managing his innings right now is perfectly fine because yeah, it sucks to lose against the Yankees, but you know what? I'd rather have Bobby Miller not fatigued in October. It's a good point. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, Chris, uh, you did not stump me. I'm saying I'm giving you respect, you know, I mean, don't, don't go haywire on that. I'm giving you respect that those are good points. You want to protect these guys, but at the same point in time, if a guy is cruising to have him go out there and throw an additional 10 to 12 pitches, isn't the worst idea in the world, because guess what? Injuries could happen anytime, any place, anywhere. I mean, that's just the factor of it. Look at Walker Bueller. He's on his second Tommy John surgery, and the Dodgers kept him in bubble wrap for a long time. They limited his innings. They 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 limited his workload. They gave him extra rest. And guess what happened? It's the same thing in the NBA with this load management stuff. You're trying to protect guys. Oh, we want to yeah. limit back to backs. We've we, we've had more day added more days off. And guess what happens? Guys are still going down. Guys are still taking days off. Guy, and even with all those days off, guys are still getting hurt. So I Leonard. It, well, oh, I love it. exactly. I don't so want to tie NBA to this. Well, but. no, but there is a similarity to, to it where even if you protect somebody, you could protect your kids all you want. Guess what? They're still going to go out and get hurt once in a while. It happens. And all I'm saying is one additional inning is not going to put him on a track of getting hurt more often than, than somebody else. So to, that's where counter, I think your argument is a little bit. To counter the Walker positive. Bueller point, though. Let's not forget in the postseason, they started him not once, but twice on three days rest. And I really feel like that was the downfall of the Walker Bueller we know because some asshole named Max Scherzer decided to opt out on a pivotal game, five game, six start when they were counting on him to throw the ball. And he claimed, oh, my arm's too tired. I can't go out there. And so Walker Bueller on literally short notice yeah. had to pitch on three days rest and he did not look like himself at all in that game and i feel like from that moment on he just wasn't the same pitcher that was in october though not june go ahead jake i just want to point that out that was in october and june where there's a lot more mileage on the arm so so your but that, your your ability to get injured is is higher or well, your, that's your, what i'm saying with bobby miller too that's why you can't burn him out right now because you're gonna need to put pressure on him late in the season Go ahead, I just find it funny that, and, and I know that, that Scherzer has walked back his comments since then, but his comment about how the Dodgers were limiting his innings or his pitches led to his dead arm. So that had the inverse, uh, you know, reaction there, but yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you guys in, in a sense. And, and to Chris's point, yeah, injuries can happen whenever they, I mean, when Dustin May went down in, in May of 21, I believe that was the second inning of that game, yep. you know, or third inning or whatever it was. Like and it was in game. May. It was in yeah, May. There you go. On, yeah. You know? Some guys are just injury prone and other guys aren't, you know, they, they load manage the shit out of Julio Arias for his entire career. And it's worked. He's yeah. been durable and healthy for the entirety of his career, but that doesn't always work that way. Sure. And don't forget, Urias missed two full seasons after he burst onto the scene in 2016, where we didn't see him again until when, 2018? So he missed like a year and a half uh, with shoulder issues and elbow issues. Same with Hunjin Ryu when he was with the team. So but when I, they finally, when they finally put him in the rotation, he's been as solid as they come. 
Exactly. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And it also, I think, depends on the type of pitcher that you are. You know what I mean? Like Scherzer, Wainwright, a lot of these guys have been able to avoid serious injury. Clayton Kershaw has never really had any, knock on wood, any serious injuries as well. So I think it also depends on the type of pitcher that you are. But I mean, you know, guys have been going on short rest. They, they used to throw seven, eight, nine innings. I, and I think it's because of how they used to pitch to compare to how they are. So on that aspect, Kev, I'll give you – the point I'm just saying, though, this early in his career, one additional inning in June, I don't see the big deal if the guy is rolling and he's feeling good. That's all. I would have only I would have only made that argument if the Dodgers. I mean, what were they up one nothing at that time? No. Was or was it one 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 one? It's a yeah. tie game. So if they're up two runs, three runs, okay. But I think in that situation, it's a one one game and. You know, it happens. The the, yeah. the problem is, is that the bullpen can't keep a damn, they can't contain anything. That's yeah. been, that's been the bigger issue. Yeah. Besides that point, it was an interesting series. I mean, Aaron Judge was Aaron Judge in the second game of the series. Hit a home run off Shelby Miller. Literally took out the wall out in right field in Dodger Stadium next to the bullpen. I think some people, including myself, thought that was, you know, meant to be detached. But no. He literally broke through it, and now he's on the injured list because he hurt, stubbed his toe too hard, I guess. <laughs> Stanton came back off the IL. He hit a home run. He had, like, a double off Phillips as well. He didn't look like he missed a beat. Josh Donaldson also came off the IL. He had two home runs. Um, other Nate than that, Bowers? Bowers destroyed Grove. The only two mistakes that Grove threw happened to both be two-run home runs. Mm-hmm. And we just had no answer really for the Yankees bullpen in that series. But it was electric. I mean, the highest, the three highest selling games of Dodger Stadium this season. Yeah, the place is rocking. For sure. A lot of Yankee fans come out, man. They're still, they're still America's team. And, you know, Stanton loves hitting here. I mean, I think oh, yeah. it doesn't matter who he sees on the mound. I think every time he's looking at the pitcher, he sees Mike Bolsinger. <laughs> The stats at Dodger Stadium are crazy. It's like 10 home runs over 27 games. And OPS Mike Bolson, you're forever a trivia answer. Yep. And actually, Stanton's, uh, Stanton's walk-up song should be, I'm coming home. I'm coming <laughs> home. <laughs> maybe Bolsinger should consider st- suing Stanton next then for ruining his career. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Stiff him on some doctor's bills. Um, Other than that, I think there was one more listener question, but we got to talk about Trey Turner in a second, but let me just pull up that question in case uh, it was relevant to anything we were just discussing. No, it's a different subject, but might as well just get into it right now. Coming from Josh Git 1214 on Twitter, a guy I interact with a lot. Do we send James Altman down? He looks completely lost at the plate and on the field sometimes. I don't know. I w- I want to see I want to see them keep running him out there. I want to see him Agreed. fight through this. I, I I I don't think that there's any use for him to go back down to the minors and just sit there and rake. Um we know he can hit major league pitching. He's just in a a slump, you know? Like he's not he's not connecting with pitches that are in the zone. That's something between the ears, you know, it's not so much that they figured out a hole in his swing, which they figured out kind of where you need to pitch him, but he just needs to be more selective too, because he's, he, he's going up there with an O2 count. It seems every time. And he's missing pitches that he, that he usually hits. He's missing pitches. He's also just taking pitches right down the middle. I mean, he looks like a lost puppy running around in a Petco right now. I mean, I feel, I feel for the guy. And he's hitting 230 on the season, but I was surprised to see that his expected batting average is actually 201. So does that mean he's hitting into some luck earlier in the season? He is literally the worst hitter right now in baseball when it comes to plate discipline. He has the highest chase rate out of, or I should say he has the highest swing and miss percentage out of anybody. He's top five or top 10, whatever it is, because he might not have the at-bats now, but up there in strikeouts. I mean, he is pretty good defensively. His outs above average is 91 out of 100. So, I mean, I actually have been pretty impressed with him on defense, and I love his arm strength. He's 
been th- able to throw guys out. But uh, at the plate, I mean, I don't know what's going on in his head. I would love for him to just maybe swing a little more and be aggressive with these pitches down the middle. So hopefully our hitting coach, hitting coaches, I should say, could make the adjustments because I do think he is poised and talented enough to make a comeback. I don't want to send him down on triple A. I actually thought they should have started him against a bad pitcher named Luke Weaver this this afternoon, this evening. They didn't do it. Like you got to, he just faced a string of tough pitchers, roll them out there against these scrubs and see what happens. Oh, I agree. I I think sticking with him, it's, it's good for him because listen, this game is all about adjustments and then readjusting and then readjusting to the readjustments of the adjustments. So that's what this game is about. I don't care if your name is Cody Bellinger. I don't care if your name is Yasiel Puig. I don't care if your name was Mike Trout or anything like that. You are going to go through it, ladies and gentlemen. That That is why Garrett Anderson once said, being a 300 hitter basically means you're failing 70% of the time. That's what this game is. It will beat you down to your damn knees. But you know what separates the winners from the losers? Getting back up on that horse after getting kicked in the teeth. And that's what Outman needs to do because I agree, it is between the years. So once he's able to settle down, relax, and stop caring, and I know that sounds bad, stop caring in the sense of pressing. Once he starts doing that, things will happen again. But he's got to he's got to clean it up right here right now because he's panicking after experiencing some adversity. After an amazing April, they figured him out. Now you got to adjust yep. to the adjustments. Yeah, agreed 100%. Dodgers, after the uh, Reds, they got two more games with the Reds. They will go to Philadelphia and play the Phillies, a team they absolutely ambushed at Dodger Stadium earlier this season. They swept them. Um, Phillies are still struggling a little bit. They're 29 and 32. Kyle Schwarber is their home run leader. He's got 16 dingers, but he's only hitting 173, kind of like a Max Muncy like stat line from a couple years ago. Uh, Nick, Nick Castellanos has been a pretty good hitter, 315 batting average. Bryce Harper, I guess the early comeback isn't phasing him one bit. He's got an 840 OPS, 295 batting average, three home runs. But I want to get into Trey Turner because I feel like at one point, this was not only Jake's boy, but Chris's boy too. I think you both are big, heavy advocates to re-sign Trey, but then Jake eventually flipped my way and said, no, he's not worth the money. And, I mean, so far he's not looking like an 11-year, $300 million player. I, I, In fairness, I had made that comment about wanting to keep Trey Turner in the middle of the season. I changed right. my tune after a, a disastrous October, not with the bat, with the glove. And I'm just like, whether whether he can't hit or can't field, I just don't want to find out like if which what it's going to be next season. And to pay him three hundred million dollars for eleven years, ugh, no I'm thanks. Crazy. Yeah, he is not with off- that, not with that glove, and now and 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 not with just the inability to 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 get fired up for i don't know i just he he never really felt like a like a dodger to me like he just he 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 really did feel like a rental which he was but it never felt like he was he was really a part of this team and and i don't know whether it was an attitude or whatever but i I, i'm i'm was totally okay with with letting him go if he doesn't have an L.A. attitude, he certainly doesn't have a Philadelphia attitude. That's for sure. I mean, they they would they're going to eat him alive. And that's that's what it is. You know, if you're going to pick that town, beware what you wish for, because that when you're doing good, they want more when you're doing bad. Eesh, be somewhere else. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, they're already they already are booing him. I think even his mom booed him. I don't know if that was a joke or a realistic thing, but. Trey Turner right now is a 240 hitter for the Phillies. He only has a 283 on base percentage, very low on base plus slugging as well, just seven home runs and eight steals. So as a Phillies fan, you cannot be happy with that production at all. That is just so like unturner like. Yeah. I mean, just I mean, well, you put him in a lineup with Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts and things things change, but it's not like he's it's not like he's you know, playing for the, uh, I don't know, give me a bad team, the nationals Oakland. again, you yeah. know what I mean? Like or it, Oakland. Yeah. Right. You know, he's in a good lineup. So I don't know. I don't yeah. know what's going on. 
For sure. I mean, the batting average is the one thing that stands out to me. Cause I'm not, I, I mean, this guy's a career 300 hitter. He hit right around 300 last year. And it's just like, how is he at 240? And, and I have a theory yeah. about this guys. And I just mentioned it about Philly. The grass ain't always greener on the other side, even if the money is. Sometimes you got to worry about fit, where, where, where you're at as far as fit goes, because now there's pressure, there's expectations, because it's like, hey, we went to the World Series without you, bro. So if you're going to come here, you better help us win, win games and help us get back to finish what we started a year ago. And I just think those expectations without somebody to really back him up, you know what I'm saying? I, I just don't think it's there right now. I don't think it's a really good fit. That being said, I, I still think, Kev, that he busts loose out of this and ends up having a productive season the next three months. We'll see. Last season, he hit 323 against fastballs, and he's hitting 224 against them this season. He hit 330 against off-speed pitches last season. He's hitting 176 against them this season. If I had to put money on him, he probably will end up hitting closer to 280 than 240 or whatever I said by the time the season ends. But looking at things down the pipeline, 11 years, I don't think this contract's going to age well at all. I would bet four years into this, there's going to be talks of them trying to get rid of him. I just don't see his body holding up. Well, that's all I had on my agenda today. Was there any other topics or final thoughts you guys wanted to get into real quick before i close out the show with the final segment i have a quick question for you kev would you add tim anderson to your uh proposed deal that you put on twitter okay. yeah let's let's talk about the pro proposed deal proposed deal sorry yeah um at one point i was kind of on board with signing tim anderson but then i was really diving into his defensive metrics and especially this season he's been pretty atrocious defensively and yep. I do feel like bat wise, he is an obvious upgrade over um, Miguel Rojas and Chris Taylor for that matter. But this offense for the most part is just putting up runs and Jake brought it up earlier, how we're scoring runs left and right. And the pitching is blowing it for us. If I were the Dodgers right now, the priority has to be pitching. And so the proposed deal that you were alluding to did involve Liam, Liam Hendricks. And I'm still going to go down that rabbit hole. I, I feel like the Dodgers need a guy, a guy with closer experience, such as Hendricks. I don't care that he's off to a slower start to begin the season. I mean, the man just overcame cancer. I wouldn't expect him to be sharp right out of the gate, but he is excellent for the most part in high leverage. And I, in addition, threw in Lucas Giolito because I do feel like the Dodgers could use a mid arm front of I'm the coming home. <laughs> Another guy that is local to Los Angeles, but this guy, Giolito, is a proven veteran. He would also be a rental, so you don't have to commit to him. You know he can eat up innings. He'll give you basically six innings every time out. And so just in case Dustin May doesn't come back this season and a guy like Gonsolin or Rios goes back on the IL, uh, maybe Miller's gassed, et cetera, you have extra insurance because I feel like right now, the Dodgers have four starters. It'll be five if Urias comes back. But one one hit, one injury, we're kind of screwed. Yeah, unless, of course, you get a guy like Pepio back. I do like your trade idea. You know, Giolito, man, he's kind of fallen off, though, the last few years since he was, was named an all-star. Through but six no-hit innings against the Yankees earlier this evening. I'd like to see him over a span of a few weeks pitch really well. But, yes, I mean – this guy is a capable ace. He's a former all-star. What the type of guy that checks off all the boxes for, for the Dodgers, a, a former all-star who struggled a little bit. Uh, he hasn't won a Cy Young, but he was a finalist for a Cy Young. I think at one point, right guys. Uh, so you have that Southern California native, put him in the hands of Mark Pryor gives us a, another, you know, front line two, three kind of guy in the middle of your uh, rotation. It's good. I'm still intrigued by Tim Anderson because I think it's one of those dudes you take him out of a bad situation in Chicago, put him into a good situation in LA, he could get rolling. And of course, with Hendricks, uh, he shores up that ninth inning and really lines everything up behind him. And, and I think that's really going to be important. The defense really does bother me, though. I think I'm I think I'm shell shocked from what happened with Trey Turner. I really am. And and to a certain degree, Corey Seeger. Like I I just having a guy that can handle the shortstop position defensively is so important. And I think with Miguel Rojas being there, who's been pretty damn good as a, as a defensive shortstop, 
the offense is carrying, they need an outfield bat. So I I would I would love to have Tim Anderson on on my team. I think he's a great you know clubhouse leader type rah rah type of guy that can really you know ignite a team. But I I would I would go after him as a a more of a throw in than the than the central piece of a tra- of a trade package. Wow. Okay. You just get the feeling that Andrew Freeman's gonna trade for some random veteran outfield, and we're gonna be like. Oh shit. You're <laughs> making allusions to like Curtis Granderson, Joey Gallo. It yeah. was an outfielder, Here but comes David Freeze. Fran Mill Reyes. <laughs> this at season least, at least could, be, bat. could be Andrew McCutcheon for all I know. Hey, Shane Bieber's name's being floated out there. I don't know how that asking price is gonna be, but that would be something to look at, you know, just saying. Yeah, he is gonna come at a hefty price. And to be honest, his peripherals don't do it peripherals do not back up the pitcher of Shane Bieber. I mean, he's thrown 80 innings and only has 55 strikeouts. That's scary. That's a true pitch to contact type of guy. And that usually doesn't play out well in the postseason. You know, who's been pitching at a high level, but I know David and even Jake's not a big fan of him. Marcus Stroman. Marcus Stroman is pitching. Well, I, I, he's had a great season. I I think, I think David's contention with him is more about his uh, off the field personality than, his on the field personality because he's or is on on the field ability because he has he has been pitching really well. I still think if you want to deal with the Nationals, getting a guy like Kyle Finnegan that would be a solid piece as well. You know, that's someone who could handle the ninth inning. But if you wanted to put Phillips in the ninth inning, that guy could also be a setup man. I like that, Kyle Finnegan. Yeah, I don't know if Kyle fin- Finnegan would be my closer because. I mean, the Nationals aren't exactly a team that's competing, and the the magnitude isn't higher. And he, what has he got? He's got a 4.56 ERA and a 1.5 WHIP. I don't know if that plays, Chris. I'm just saying, he, it could be a setup man. You know, I mean, he does have a boatload of saves, but yes, on a few of his outings, it, he's gotten shelled. But if you want to put Phillips in the ninth, at least you have a guy capable of pitching the eighth. I'm just saying you could kind of go that route as well. Cause he's always been kind of a late inning guy rather than a true closer. Totally. Cannot find how many blown saves he's had this season, but I do feel like he's had a, a decent amount, but Trust I, me, he's not my fantasy team. I know <laughs> <laughs> five thirty five FIP yikes 11 saves. I don't see how many opportunities, but I don't know, Chris, I might have to veto that idea. Kyle Finnegan isn't exactly a true high leverage guy. He might be a high leverage guy because he's been thrown into the fire, but he's not exactly uh, producing at a Dodger like level. All right. Well, we got a few minutes left. I mentioned this before the show. Just wanted to talk real quick. I'll ask both you guys, if you could give me two quick Lakers predictions of what they do this off season, I would like to hear them right now. I mean, I, 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 believe the front office when they say that they're going to try and keep this core intact. I really, really hoping that they do. And I think the priority has got to be Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura, but I don't know. I don't know what else they, I don't know what else they can, they can add. I'm not, I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to bring back D'Angelo Russell after that no show performance in the Western conference. finals. Can't bring him back. All right. That's Jake, Chris, your turn. I agree. I think Reeves and Hachimura should be uh, should be the priority, and I think they will be. Uh, you still got to add some shooting, so some wing depth. I don't know if they're going to bring back Alani Walker. Uh, he played well for them, started to really buy into the role coming off the bench. I would say cut ties with Malik Beasley, maybe even Mo Bamba as well, try to find a good, capable backup center. Here's the thing about D'Lo. He played really well the final two months of the season. Big reason why the Lakers – got into the playoffs and in the play-in situation, played well in the first two rounds. He got exposed in a bad series. Hey, not the first time we've seen a guy crack under the pressure in a series. See Clayton Kershaw, 2013, 2014, 2016. Not trying to throw shade at one of the all-time greats, but that's a guy who has floundered in a high moment. But what do we say about the other six months? He's great. So that's the thing you kind of have to look at the macro, not so much the micro with D'Angelo Russell, because to get any of these other guys like Kyrie, like Fred Van Vliet, it's going to be very difficult. So I'm saying if he's willing to come back, you're willing to bring him back. 
maybe a, at a little bit less at maybe four for 90 instead of four for a hundred. And you put that 10 million towards shooting. I'm, I'm okay with that. I didn't hear one outside name, real prediction. I'm disappointed with you guys. Kyrie ain't happening, but here's my predictions. I think they're going to package is it's the 17th overall pick, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to yeah. take that pick. They'll probably throw in Beasley salary and then one other guy. And they're going to trade that to Indiana for the great shooter known as Buddy Heald. I'm throwing that prediction out right. I hope you're right, right on now. that. Yeah. They're going to bring in Buddy Heald. And then they're going to take D'Angelo Russell's salary and try to do a sign and trade. Maybe with Atlanta, bring in DeJounte, how do I, DeJounte Murray. DeJounte Murray. I mean, I, I think too. they would be pretty inclined and happy with that type of offseason. Bring in a shooter in Heald and a playmaker in Murray. Those are my two predictions for the Lakers. That seems like a big, that's a, seems like a big, uh, a lot to give up for Buddy Heald. No? Uh, not first... necessarily. I mean, Heald's having a, had a really good season. And I think Indiana, they may decide to move on from him because they got some other wing players and as well. And they may end up drafting another one. So, um, yes, I, the thing is, everyone said cut ties with Beasley, but he's got a club option. I'd rather flip that salary and turn it into something. So I do like that idea, Kev. I think another name to keep an eye on in case Rui Hachimura leaves, a guy I would like to see to replace him in that position, Grant Williams from the Boston Celtics. Good motor guy, little undersized, not as tall as Rui, but can defend multiple positions, always plays hard, willing to get into the face of Jimmy Butler, could rebound, and he's got some experience behind him now. So that's a guy just to keep an eye on as well. All right. Well, Chris Camello, really appreciate you joining the show. Chris, what are your final thoughts? Um, as, as much as everyone's frustrated on this Tuesday night after blowing a five run lead in Cincinnati, look, there's another game tomorrow. There's another game after that. They could turn this around real quick. And as long as you can kind of come back on this road trip on a winning note, you'll be fine. If not, Hey, it's June, June swoon. It happens. You can find Chris on Twitter and follow him at Chris underscore Camello and make sure to download and listen to the outlet forum where he's talking basketball. Jake, what are your final thoughts? Um, I, I it was a very frustrating loss. Um, and I, I, I don't, I, I don't think that it, it is going to linger. I don't think it's, it's going to be the beginning of a, uh, like a huge losing streak by any chance. Um, but, but these guys have to be better. Just like Dave Roberts says, they just have to be better. And I like the fact that he called them out. I, I, I like to see a little fight in Dave Roberts, a little salty Dave action. Um, I, 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 I want to see that more in my manager, uh, because, because it's not about calling guys out, right? It's not about saying these guys were shit. It's, I know how good these guys are and they should be better than what they've been doing. So that's what that is. And, and I hope that that message is heard loud and clear and these guys clean it up. Amen. My final thoughts along the same lines, not faulting Dave Roberts for this most recent loss. This is on the players, especially the bullpen. Th these guys are fighting for their jobs. I mean, Phil Bickford, I don't care that he went on the IL. That was a phantom injury. No way is he actually hurt. I mean, He's one of the first to go if guys start to come back. And I think that they're going to hit a point where there's just no hesitation. They're going to have to start letting guys loose if they can't perform. I don't care who it is. All we have right now is Evan Phillips. And the bridge to him is bumpier than a ride at Magic Mountain. So bullpen's really got to step it up. That's going to be probably the difference in our season how many games the dodgers bullpen can hold together that was the staple in years past that's how we were able to compile and win so many games year in year out and i believe that this pitching staff has given up more 10 plus run games than 21 and 22 combined so far this season and 2020 those three years combined they've given up more run 10 plus run games or whatever it is than those three years combined it's been a hot pile of shit like jake pointed out um off the air on our Instagram, this Dodgers bullpen is a dumpster fire covered in shit and is an absolute mess right now. And they got to get it together. Everyone have a great week. Make sure to subscribe to the Incline Dodgers podcast wherever you listen. Download, subscribe, and please give us a five-star rating if you enjoy our content. Thanks again to Chris for joining us. Always love having you on. Jake, have a great week. 
this is a big test for Noah Syndergaard. We are either going to be talking about him ma- being maintained in the rotation, or we'll be talking about Noah Syndergaard packing his bags for China and being roommates with Trevor Bauer one of these days. It's no no in between. <laughs> I hope we're playing the song dun 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 cue the Avengers soundtrack. I want to hear that when yeah. Thor comes through in Cincinnati on Wednesday night. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone. Go Dodgers and bullpen do better. <laughs>